So here's how chapter 8 works. 8.1 and 8.2 are pretty much a rundown of how you do hypothesis testing. 8.3, 8.4, and 8.5 are our specifics. Here's how you do hypothesis testing for, hey, proportions. Well, that's what we just did, right? right it was 7.2. And then means when you know sigma, and then means when you don't know sigma. Do you see the correlation between chapter 7 and chapter 8? It's the same progression of... Of, uh, of our situation here. We're going to have proportions and then means knowing sigma and then means without knowing sigma. So same ideas. Of course we're going to probably be using a z-score, then a z-score, then a t-score. You got it? That's the idea. In 8.2 we get a rundown though. We get exactly what it is or what it means to do this hypothesis testing stuff. So let's look at 8.2. Okay, well, what's a hypothesis? Some, some sort of claim, right? Some sort of claim about something in, in general terms. I know a lot of you are taught a hypothesis is an, an estimated, an educated guess. that you're. But what do you do with the educated guess? You, just, you don't just leave it, right? You don't say, well, I'm educated, so I'm going to make a guess. This must be true. I win. Right? <laughs> but that's usually not how science goes, at least, when you first deal with hypotheses. You do a hypothesis, or you make a hypothesis, and then you put <coughs> an experiment, don't you? And you see whether that hypothesis was actually a, a true statement, or whether that was just complete garbage. You either prove it right or you prove it wrong. You with me on that? That's basically what we're doing here. This hypothesis testing is testing whether or not a claim is valid. That's the whole idea for this whole chapter. What's a claim? What is a claim then? Some sort of statement. Yeah, you're, you're exactly right. Here's some examples of some very simple claims that we could actually test based on fact, based on a sample. Uh, one example would be, I think I, I made these ones up. One example would be, uh, most people get their jobs through networking. You ever heard of networking? Networking is it, that statement, it's all about who you know. Not about what you know, it's all about who you know. You ever heard that before? Well, do you believe that's true? Well, then you believe you get your jobs through networking. And a lot of people do. So if I made the statement, most people get their jobs through networking. We could actually translate that into a statement we can now test. Here's the deal. Firstly, if I say most people get their jobs through networking, <coughs> are we dealing with a proportion or a mean here, do you think? When I say something like most people, that's a proportion. What's most mean to you? We'll say it again. More than 50%. That would be most to me. Would that be most to you? If I have most of the pie, I have most of... That's more than half of it. That's 50% 50, 50 or more of the pie. Well, actually, just slightly more than 50% of the pie. Does that make sense? So, I love pie. Oh my gosh, I, I, I'm so thankful that Thanksgiving's coming up so I can eat my pie. That's fantastic. I'm gonna have most of the pie, trust me on that. So most, most is a proportion that says more than 50%. So if I'm talking about most people, of course that is a proportion. We use the letter P for proportion. We'd be testing the claim that most people the proportion is more than 50%. Do you see how we can translate this claim into that statement? Yeah? You have to identify whether something's a, a proportion or, or an average. Now, if it's an average, it's going to say average. If it's a proportion, it's going to give you something like most or more than 60% or less than 20%. It's going to have a percentage or it's going to say most. You with me on that? It gives you a proportion. So we'd say, all right, the proportion, or most people get their jobs through networking, that would be a proportion's more than 50%. Or P is greater than more than 50%. Here's another example.
<laughs> the average payload of trucks on the 99, that's a freeway, in case you didn't know that. Just saying. Just saying. Is 18,000 pounds. Is that a claim? Sure, I just I just stated that claim. I just said, okay, here, here's what it is. I said the average payload of trucks on the 99 is 18,000 pounds. Now, uh, are we dealing with proportion or means here, do you think? Means. means. Why? Average. It says average. Notice how I'm using a population parameter here. I'm not using P hat, right? I'm trying to say something about the whole population. We're going to figure out in just a moment how we can use sample data to do that. It's a pretty interesting thing. Okay, we're going to find that out. But I'm, I'm saying something about the population. This is a claim about the population. Do you see that? It's not about a sample. We'd be certain about a sample. We're going to be testing claims about populations. So instead of average payload, of instead of a, popu a proportion here, I have an average. What symbol am I going to use if it's about a population? Definitely mu. X bar or mu? What do you think? Mu. What am I trying to say? Is it greater than, less than, or equal to? <laughs> Why? What says it's equal to? <laughs> Can you get from here to here on your own? Can you determine that the average is 18,000? You see, what this, this chapter is about is translate into a claim and then testing that claim. You see, anybody can make these up. I could say, the average payload of trucks on the 99 is 500 million pounds. That's a claim, right? Is it a true claim? No. But you'd have to find out how to prove me wrong. And that's what we're going to do in this section. In order to do that, we've got to talk about something called the rare event rule. Now, we've talked about it before, but now we're going to be more specific. Rare event rule. You see, we're going to be making assumptions out of these claims. And we're going to be testing the probability of those assumptions. Hey, if the probability is really, really small, let's, let, let me repeat that for you. We're, we're going to be making assumptions out of these claims. We're going to be testing the probability of those assumptions being true. If the probability of those assumptions is really small, what do you know about that assumption? It's probably wrong. It's probably wrong, right? Like my 500 million pounds. I said, I'm going to assume that every truck on the road, or the average payload of the trucks on the road is 500 million pounds. Is that a lot of weight? Yeah. That's ridiculous. <laughs> that would just obliterate concrete below it, OK? <laughs> it's gone. I mean, no asphalt. The, the tires would just pop immediately. If this truck, this guy would uh. spit nothing would happen, all right? So that's a huge amount of weight. So is that? What's the probability that I'm going to go out there? See, here's the thing. If I assume that's correct, if I say I'm going to assume that the trucks on the road weigh 500 million pounds, and I go out there, what's the probability I'm going to even find one of those trucks? So I'm going to take a sample of all those trucks, right? Is the average of those trucks going to be 500 million pounds? No. So the probability, according to my sample, would be close to zero. You with me on that? That means that my assumption was probably way off. That's what we're doing. We're going to be testing a claim by looking at, at a statement, assuming it's true, and then proving it wrong. That's what we're going to do. So rare event rule says, if the probability of an assumption occurring is really small, then the assumption is wrong. Now I'm gonna I'm gonna put this in quotation that very small because we don't know how much that is, <coughs> and it's actually gonna change on a test by test basis for you. So we're gonna study that in just a bit. But if the probability of assumption occurring is really small, then the assumption is probably incorrect.
Now wait a second. I say I include that word probably. Probably. Are you going to be sure, one hundred percent sure, whether that assumption is true or false? No. Were you one hundred percent sure that the actual value of your mean fell within the range that we just created? Were you one hundred percent sure of this? No, you were ninety nine percent sure of this, right? Hey, those confidence levels are going to come back at you. You're going to be ninety five percent sure that your assumption is wrong, or ninety nine percent sure that your assumption is wrong, or ninety percent sure that your assumption is wrong. Are you, are you getting me on that? So that level of confidence, you're never going to be one hundred percent sure. Never ever going to be one hundred percent sure. Statistics is not about being one hundred percent sure, but it's finding enough evidence that you're reasonably sure. <coughs> So now we've got to determine what this very small means. This is the difference between a likely event and an unlikely event. What is usual to happen and what's not usual to happen. Shall we do an example on, on that to kind of illustrate that for you? Okay. I read this somewhere. I don't know if it's actually true. I could just be making it up because <laughs> it happens a lot. Uh, but this, there's a chance that it's true. I don't know. Uh, one of you sciencey people out there, uh, are there drugs that will determine the, the sex of a child, like help you get a girl versus a boy? I think there are. I was pretty sure I was right on this. I don't think I just made it up. Uh, but if I didn't make it up, and this is right, this is awesome. Uh, what now? What now? I don't know where it's at. You can in animals, but I don't know about humans. Humans are animals? Yeah. Well, yeah, but I think it's livestock. Okay. Never mind. <laughs> Here's what this drug claimed to do. This drug said that if, if you inject this drug into a woman, there's an 80% chance that her child will be a girl. You got it? You can't do that with the boys, but there's an 80% chance you can, you can have a girl. So here's the claim. This is the drug company's claim. If you use this drug, there will be an 80% chance of having a girl. What do you guys should Google that? Not right now. Not right now. <laughs> but see if that's true, if there's drugs out there like that. I was pretty sure when I, when I first did this that there, there was. Could be off though. By the way, our claim, you need to be very good at this, is our claim dealing with proportions or averages? Why proportions? 80%. 80 that's a proportion right there, right? It's not an average. It doesn't say the average of anything, does it? It says 80%. That's a proportion. So this would be a claim about proportions. 80% chance of having a girl. <coughs> or at least 80% chance of having a girl. Here's what happened. Uh, they studied 100 couples. A random sample of 100 couples was studied. Here's what you would do to try to test it, it would say um, at least. Say so you have at least an 80% chance of having a girl in this case, all right? Not exactly 80%, but we'll say at least. It makes things a little bit easier. We'll discover this in a couple sections, but this would be nice for us. Here's what you would do. Okay, try, try to stick with me on this thing. According to your claim, your claim says that if if that's true, then 80 of these couples should have girls, right? You with me on that? What you would do is you'd start by assuming that the drug doesn't work. You'd say, I'm going to assume the drug doesn't work. That means that 50% should have girls and 50% should have boys. Are you with me on that? The assumption would be... <coughs> the assumption would be the drug doesn't work. Now 
Now you might be wondering, why? Why, why do we even have this assumption? Well, here's the, the weird part about statistics. Kind of, the, kind of the sucky part, really, if you want to consider it the sucky part. You can't ever prove anything right in statistics. You can't. It's impossible. You can't be sure enough to prove anything right. You're never 100% sure. But you can be sure enough to prove something wrong. So it's kind of like uh, in court, can, you, can someone ever be found innocent? They never say that, do they? They don't say, we find you innocent. No, what do they say? Not guilty. Not guilty. They say, it's kind of a, a pessimistic way to look at it, isn't it? It says, well, either we, we have enough evidence to convict you or we don't. You might have done it in both cases, but here we had it. I don't, I'm not saying you're innocent. OJ did it. He did it. <laughs> but he was found not guilty, wasn't he? Right? So it's either you have enough evidence to prove someone wrong, guilty, or you don't, not guilty. You can't ever prove someone right, innocent. You can't do it. In statistics, you can't prove anything right. So if you want to prove a statement true, you have to state the opposite of it and then prove that statement wrong. Do you see the idea? You can't ever prove a statement true, so you state the opposite of it and try to prove that statement wrong. That inherently proves your original statement true. It's a weird way of looking at it, I understand that, but know that statistics can't prove something right, it can only uh, prove statements incorrect. That's all it can do. So we're going to assume the drug doesn't work. If the dr drug doesn't work, then that would mean 50% girls and 50% boys. Remember, this is our assumption. We're going to assume the drug doesn't work. Let me give you two cases. Let's say this happened. Let's say they tested these 100 couples. You ready for this? You ready? I hope you're with me on this. You understand the idea that the doesn't work thing, right? How that we can only prove statements wrong. We can't prove statements right. Just check out how this would work. We, you know, we're, we're not actually into the math yet. We're, we're all in the theory still. Let's say that these couples, 52 of them, had girls. Out of the 100, 52 of them had girls. The question is, is this number, this, remember this is out of 100, right? 52 out of 100 had girls. Is this 52 <coughs> different enough from this 50% to make this statement wrong? If I say 50-50, it's if I say 50, 50 if I, we have 100 couples, and I say, you, you know inherently that it's 50% girls, 50% boys, right? Without taking any drugs, there's a 50-50 chance you're going to get a girl or a boy. Yes. And I say, okay, 52 of you had, had girls out of 100. Is that usual or unusual? It would be pretty normal, wouldn't it? Is it different enough from this to prove that statement wrong? No. This would say, our statement, well, our assumption was the drug doesn't work. This doesn't prove that statement right, but it doesn't falsify that statement either. So we, we'd say, yeah, the drug probably doesn't work. We can't prove it. But only 52 of them had girls. I mean, that, that's not good enough to prove that statement wrong. Are you with me on that? Now check this example out. Let's say that 97 out of 100 had girls. <coughs> Ninety-seven out of one hundred had girls. Is ninety-seven out of a hundred way different than fifty out of a hundred? It's pretty significantly different, isn't it? If I said to you, what's the chances, think about this, what's the chances that I didn't give anybody drugs or that the drug doesn't work and ninety-seven out of a hundred of them had girls? Is that rare? That's really, really rare. <coughs> this is way different than that one. This, this probability of this happening, assuming the drug doesn't work, is really rare. So what's it say about, say about that statement? If the probability of this happening is rare, considering this statement, then this statement is probably false. So the, the statement, the drug doesn't work, is probably wrong. What's it say about the drug? It works. It works. That's how you prove a statement true. You assume like the opposite of it, you assume, some, you assume some statement that you can prove true or false, and then you try to do that. Sometimes, you're not going to get enough evidence. Only 52 out of 100 had girls. Does that prove that one wrong? No. It doesn't say anything. This would do nothing for you. But this one, that's a rare thing. That's a rare thing considering your statement. If the drug didn't work, this wouldn't happen. Does that make sense to you? 
That wouldn't happen in real life. If you just if you compared the hundred people with, with the drugs to the hundred people without the drugs, that's not going to happen in people without the drugs. It's going to be really close to it's going to be like that. Okay. So this this about this uh, this action, this occurrence is very rare. That says your assumption's probably wrong. If your assumption's wrong, the drug doesn't work. If that's wrong, then the drug does work, and that proves that claim, that at least it'll give you an 80% chance to have control. How many people understood the idea of this hypothesis test? Good. Now, that's an overall rundown. What we're really doing is, is comparing the probability of things occurring. If the probability is rare enough, the assumption's probably wrong. So, we are still talking about the introduction to hypothesis testing. And if you remember from the last time we did this, what we're trying to do is to prove a claim incorrect, or prove a claim correct by stating that some claim and proving it wrong, thereby proving our original claim correct. It's kind of a backwards way of doing things. I, I made the analogy that this is like when you're in court. You can't ever prove someone innocent, right? You can't guarantee they didn't do it. All you can do is prove them guilty or not guilty. Either you have enough evidence to condemn them, or you don't have enough evidence to condemn them. We are either going to have enough evidence to condemn our claim, or not have enough evidence to condemn our claim, and therefore can't reject it. We're either going to reject or fail to reject our claim. We're never going to be accepting. We're never going to be accepting. Um, I, I say, I say, claim. We're, this this next part I'm going to tell you about. This next part I'm going to tell you about is called the hypothesis. With hypothesis testing, you actually have two hypotheses. We're going to be having something called a null hypothesis. The null hypothesis and the alternative hypothesis. We'll talk about that in just a second. But let me give you kind of the characteristics of the null hypothesis. When we talk about the null hypothesis, and I'll, I'll put it up here too, versus the alternative. Hypothesis. When we talk about the null, we'll do that first here, null hypothesis. We're going to denote that with a special symbol. This seems kind of appropriate for the, for the season. It is H sub zero. Looks like ho, 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 ho. <laughs> Not the other type of ho, all right? <laughs> Sick people. Right. Yeah, it's, it's H sub zero. It's, we don't say, we don't say ho. Uh, you, some, some classes do, they say ho and ha. Because the, the, the <laughs> it's funny. Ho for the, the null, and then alternative has a little A, right? So ho, ho, ha, ha. Right? That's, that's how. The, we're going to do H sub 0 and H sub 1, the null hypothesis and the alternative hypothesis. That just seems a little bit less funny and more, more serious, so we can have like serious statistics students. But th this is how you write it. It's denoted H sub 0. It stands for the null hypothesis. That's, that's it. What this does, this is a, a unique idea. This is always going to be a statement that reflects some population parameter is equal to a value. This is a statement of equality. So when you talk about the null hypothesis, you must absolutely have an equal statement in there. Do you understand? The null hypothesis will have an equal sign. It's a statement of equality. It says the population proportion is equal to some value. Or the population mean or the population standard deviation. It's some parameter. I know I'll make it It states that the population parameter Remember that a population parameter, in our case, we can talk about the mean or the proportion. Ladies and gentlemen, what symbol do you use for the population mean? Mu. Mu. So we're talking about mu's here. How about for the population proportion? P. With a hat or not? No hat. No hat. That's, that's population. 
So we're talking about mu's and p's. That's that's what we're talking about as far as the null. The, the null. We're going to have these things equal to some value. So it states that the population parameter, either mean or proportion, is equal equal to some value. Let me give you an example. Just just simple example here. Here's how your null hypothesis will look when you're doing this. First example, you could you'll have a sub zero with a colon there. You'll have some statement, like let's say we're talking about the mean, we'd have mu. It's just gonna say, let's suppose that the mu is equal to five. That could be a null hypothesis. Notice how we have some population parameter. It's it's the mean this time. It's equal to some number. So that equality that has to be there, that's always gonna happen for the null hypothesis. If you're talking about per, uh, the proportion, you would have p equals like, I don't know, 0.5. Remember, proportions have to be decimals, and means don't have to be decimals less than one. So proportion, you're going to have to be between 0 and 1, means it, that that, uh, that necess necessity isn't there. You okay with this so far? So we just have these things called null hypotheses. We know that it's going to have some parameter mu or p, and it's going to be equal to some number. Now, this is, this is always how we do a hypothesis test. That's going to be a little bit of a, a, a recall for you. This is how we do it. How to test hypothesis. What you're going to do here, this is the interesting part of hypothesis testing. You are going to assume, did you remember doing the assumptions? We said we're going to assume this is true. If we come up with evidence that's not true, we're going to reject it. If we don't come up with evidence, well, we can't, we can't assume it's wrong. Here's what you do. You assume that this right here is true. You assume that the null hypothesis is always true. And then you work to reach a conclusion. So how you do a hypothesis test, you begin by assuming the null hypothesis, h sub 0, is true. You start by assuming the null hypothesis is a true statement. Then you use evidence to reach one of these conclusions. Evidence, by the way, is given to you by your sample. Here's your two options. Right, they're they're going to be given to you by your evidence. When you start by assuming that h sub 0 is true, that the null hypothesis is true, you're going to be either proving it wrong or not having enough evidence to prove it wrong. You see, here's the idea. You're going to, all you can do with hypothesis testing is to prove something wrong. You can't ever prove it right. Remember, like I said with the, the courts, you can't ever prove someone innocent. You can only prove them guilty or not guilty. Either you have enough evidence or you don't. Here's what that comes down to for us. Either you're going to reject the null hypothesis, or you're going to fail to reject the null hypothesis. That's it. Are you ever going to be able to accept the null hypothesis? Mm -hmm. No, never. You're never going to be able to do it. Because you're never going to have enough evidence to prove it completely right. All you're going to have enough evidence to do is to prove it wrong, 
or not be able to prove it wrong. That, it's kind of a pessimistic way of looking at things. You can't ever prove that, that claim right. But that's the way the courts work too. You can't ever prove anybody innocent. You can only prove them guilty. This is guilty. You have enough evidence to say it's wrong. Or not guilty. You don't have enough evidence to say it's wrong. Does that make sense to you? This is our whole theme for hypothesis testing. So rejecting a sub zero, here's what this says in English. It says, I have enough evidence to prove this statement wrong. I have enough evidence to prove H sub zero is wrong. Here's what this says. This one says, I don't have enough evidence to prove H sub zero wrong. I don't and then finish that off, have enough evidence to prove H sub zero wrong. So a little side note over here, you cannot accept H sub zero, it's impossible. You're, you're never ever going to accept H sub zero. You can only reject it or fail to reject it. Failing to reject it doesn't mean that you accept it. That's a common misconception for statistics students. They go, oh, well, this means you reject it, and this means you accept it. No. No, you reject it, saying it's dead wrong, or you fail to reject it. That's not saying it's right. right? Remember the, the court system. When you think about this, remember the court system. Either it's guilty, they're going to jail, or they're not guilty, they're not going to jail. But does that mean the person definitely didn't do it? No, remember OJ, he, he did it, he did it. He wrote a book saying, I, here's how I, if I, I didn't do it, but if I did, here's how I did it, okay? <laughs> he did it, but that's what this says, okay? He might not have gone to jail, but he definitely did it. There just wasn't enough evidence to convict him. It didn't say he was innocent. Someone who is not guilty might not be innocent. There just wasn't enough evidence to put them into prison. Do you understand the difference between being innocent and being not guilty? Yes, no? Yeah. Okay, that's, that's the idea here. You can't ever accept H sub zero. You can just prove it wrong or fail to prove it wrong. You cannot accept H sub zero. Okay, well then why in the world are we doing this if all we're doing is proving statements wrong? Well, here's the cool thing about this. We're going to have another piece to this puzzle. We're going to also have not only the null hypothesis, but the alternative hypothesis. So let's take a look at that and see how these things interplay between each other. If H sub zero means the null hypothesis, how are we going to write the alternative hypothesis? H sub we, we, some books do use a sub a. They, they do. They do ho and ha. They do the, the null hypothesis and the alternative. We're going to use h sub 1 because we want to be proper and not have fun, right, basically. Uh, no, it, it just means the, the other hypothesis, the alternative. If you think about binary, 0, 1, that's the two different options you have, okay? There's the, the null hypothesis, that's the statement of equality. The alternative hypothesis is going to be the opposite statement of this thing. It's not going to have an equal sign in it. It's going to have one of these symbols, either less than, greater than, or not equal to. The equality goes here. H sub 1 has the value, the parameter is different than the state, the, the H sub 0 has it. So I'll, I'll write that out for you. What this does. This states that the parameter, whatever we're talking about, the mean of the proportion, has a value different than h sub 0. Remember, parameter for us means one of these. It states the parameter has a value different than h sub 0 has it.
here's how you can be different mathematically. In real life, you can be different lots of different ways. But in, in math, you can be different one of three different one of three ways. You can be less than a stated value, you can be greater than a stated value, or you can be not equal to a stated value. These are going to be given to you in the problem. You just have to determine which one th it's talking about. So there's three different ways to not be equal. Less than, greater than, or simply not equal. Either you're less than or greater than that. How many will feel okay with this, this so far? Good. All right. Let me give you a, a for instance on how you're going to see h sub 1, just like I, I did over here. h sub 1, we might see proportions. You could have a proportion less than a stated value, like 0.53. Or you could have greater than. Or you could have not equal to. Those are really the only three ways that you're going to see h, h sub 1, the alternative hypothesis. You'll see a less than sometimes, or greater than, or not equal to. We'll get to the why those are the way they are in just a bit. How you find out whether it's less than or greater than or not equal to, we'll, we'll do that in a while. Right now, I just want you to get comfortable with notation. Are you comfortable with notation? So h sub 0 is always going to have a what? It's always going to be equal, no matter what. That's a statement of equality. Is h sub 1 ever going to have an equal sign? Not unless there's a cross through it, a line through it. That means it's not equal. There's, there's three options there. We're, I'll teach you how to find out which option you have as we go through our problems. But you're going to have one of three things. If you're talking about not a proportion, you're talking about a mean, you could have mu less than a given value, 12, let's say. Or you could have it greater than, or you could have it not equal to. Here's the whole idea. The whole idea is that these hypotheses work together. We work together. You see, we're not actually going to be proving anything directly. What we're going to be doing is proving things indirectly. It's an interesting way to look at it. But you're going to have for each problem a null hypothesis and an alternative hypothesis, which is the opposite statement of the null. Do you get it? You have two statements. One has equality, one is opposite of that. So here's how this works. If you reject the null, that means that indirectly you accept the alternative. Do you get that? That's kind of cool. So can you accept this one? No, but you can prove it wrong. And if you prove this one wrong, it automatically proves that one right. Do you get that? So by proving this statement wrong, we prove that one right. What if we don't prove this statement wrong? Does it prove that one right? No, that it's inconclusive. You don't know. You didn't say anything about the problem. You didn't prove this right, but you didn't prove that one right either. You did nothing. So that's, that's basically the way this works. These two things work in conjunction with each other, the null and the alternative. If you prove the null hypo hypothesis wrong, that means that you accept the alternative. If you fail to prove the null hypothesis wrong, then that means you fail to accept the null hypothesis. They work together. You have to have both. You can't just prove a statement right, not with statistics. The evidence is only there to convict. It's, it's a very pessimistic way to look at it, but literally it's a, cult, it's a court system, not a cult system. We're not in a cult here. We're not Pythagoreans or something. You know the Pythagorean story, right? Killed them anyway. I'll tell you that story another time if you want. Uh, but we're, we're in a court system. We're in a court system. If you approve this one wrong, it's guilty, then you were right to convict that person, right? You, you got it. If you fail to prove that wrong, then, then, then you can't convict that person. He's free to go. Does that make sense to you? You prove this one wrong, he goes to jail. Bingo. You don't prove that one wrong, he doesn't go to jail. Nothing happens. He walks free. You don't know whether he's right or wrong. You don't know whether either of them won was right or wrong. So ultimately, this is what it boils down to. <coughs> If you want to prove a claim, I hope you're, you have your critical thinking hats on. No one has that. Oh, one person, ha one person has a hat on. The rest of you imagine hats. Two people have hats on. Technically, that's a hat. It's good. I like it. So 
If you want to prove a statement true, if you want to prove it right, can you state it as the null? If you want to prove it right, all you can do over here this null is prove it wrong or fail to prove it wrong. Can you accept it? That means you can't prove it right. So if you want to, to prove a statement right, should I, use, should I state it as the null hypothesis? If I want to prove a statement right, true, I must state it as the alternative hypothesis because that's the only one you can accept. And the only way you can accept it is by proving that one wrong. So that's what it boils down to. I know this is very vague because we're in the, in the introduction. Uh, trust me, we'll go through lots of specific examples later. I just need to get you kind of comfortable with the, the scenario before we, we get to it. Are you okay with that? So here's what it boils down to for you. If you want to support a statement, you must state it as H1, not H0. If you want to support a claim, that means prove it right, basically. If you want to support a claim, you must state it as h sub 1, not h sub 0. Why not? Well, you can't prove that right. You can't prove h sub 0 right. All you can do is prove it wrong. You don't want to make a claim you're trying to prove right and then prove it wrong, do you? Let's look at your options, okay? Let's say that you stated your claim as h sub 0. I'll teach you how to state a claim in just a bit. Let's say you stated it as h sub 0. All you could do with that is prove your claim wrong or not prove your claim at all. Are either of those a good thing? Not if you're trying to prove it right. So if you're trying to prove it correct, if you're trying to prove the statement true, you state it as this. Claim the opposite, then prove that wrong. That proves your claim. That's what you're doing. Let me give you an example of how this is, this is going to work. Remember that fertility drug I, I talked about that said uh, it gives you a, the drug said it gives you an 80% chance of having a girl? Remember that one? Let's say you're trying to prove that right. Suppose you're, you're trying to prove that your drug works, that your fertility drug works. Suppose you want to prove that your fertility drug works. Basically, here's what you would do. You're not going to make some claim like it gives you more than an 80% chance of having a girl. All you want to show is that it's, it's significantly different than 50%. You want to show that more than 50% of the people are going to have a girl with this drug. Isn't that what you want to show? Because 50-50 would be normal. You all have a chance. Well, actually, you guys, you're out of luck. You can't have children, in case you know that. But uh, only, only women can actually have. So you guys, you ignore this part. But, but you, you girls would have a 50% shot at having a, a girl. Does, does it make sense? Or a 50% shot of having a boy if you didn't take this drug at all. So what you're trying to show is that people who take this drug more than 50% of them are going to have girls. Do you get the idea? That's what you're trying to show. Should I state that as my H sub 0 or my H sub 1 if I want to prove it right? H sub 1. I want, here's, so here's what you do. You say, if I assume the drug doesn't work, the proportion of people who have girls would be 50%. Notice this would be assuming the drug doesn't work. You with me on that? This is because 50-50, it doesn't work. And then the alternative, you would state, oh, well, I want to show that the proportion of people who do have girls is more than 50%. That would be the alternative. I'll show you how to do this from a, with, from a statement specifically later on. Right now, let's just assume that we did this correctly and this is what you got out of it, okay? I'll show you how to do this later on. But here's how this would work. What you're going to be doing is you're going to be testing this claim. You with me on this? This is the claim, that's the alternative. This is the null hypothesis, this is the alternative hypothesis. You test the null hypothesis, you work it down. There's two options here. You can either reject it or fail to reject it. So here's how this works, this is pretty cool. If you work it out and you reject 
the null hypothesis. If you say, oh, I got evidence, this is wrong. You know what it does? It automatically proves that one right. And then you prove your original claim, what you wanted to show. You go, oh, hey, if this is wrong, this is true, and my drug works. More than 50% of the people will have females if they take this drug. Do you follow the idea? Now, let's say you fail to reject it. You go, well, I don't have enough evidence to show that this is wrong. Is this one right? No. Is this one right? No. It's inconclusive. You don't have enough evidence to say anything. You can't ever prove this one right. You can only prove it wrong or fail to prove it wrong. So your options are reject this, accept that. Fail to reject it, fail to reject this, nothing. And then you're, you're done, you're stuck. You can't say anything about either situation. How people understand the idea of hypothesis testing? Good, all right. So continuing on this hypothesis testing, I haven't taught you how to identify your H sub 0 and your H sub 1, which is your null and your alternative hypotheses. We've talked uh, about what those things are. We've talked about how we can state claims, but we haven't really dealt with a claim yet. We're going to do that right now. So here's how to identify your claim as either H sub 0 or H sub 1, your null or your alternative. The first thing you're going to do, you're going to state your original claim symbolically. That means that you can take that word sentence and make it into something with like equal signs or inequalities, something like that. We're going to state our original claim symbolically. Also, very important thing, you're going to state the opposite of your claim as well. You see, here's the deal. Depending on how the original claim is worded, it could be either H sub 0 or H sub 1. If you are trying to prove your own claim, if you're trying to prove your own claim, you have to state it as H sub 1. We talked about that last time. You remember talking about that last time for the people who were here? Um, if, 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 you, if you want to prove your, your, your claim, you have to state it as H sub 1. If the claim is given to you, you can't change that. Okay, it's set in stone. All your claims are going to be set in stone. Okay, you're not testing your own claims in this class. That's, that's further on when you, when you actually do your projects and statistics or you use statistics in your actual classes to do something like your, your master's degree or if they have a bachelor's project or something for you, you'd have to use statistics about that if you do any sort of survey. Uh, but, but anyway, if you, if you want to prove your own claim, it's got to be A sub 1. These claims are going to be given to you. They can either be worded as H sub 0 claims or H sub 1 claims. We're going to have to identify how to figure the, that stuff out. So in order to do that, you state your original claim symbolically and you state the opposite of the claim symbolically. Your original claim could be either H sub 0 or H sub 1. So make a note on that. The original claim could be H sub 0 or H sub 1. How you tell? It depends on where the equality is. We learned last time that h sub 0, which one, which one has the equality? The equal sign, h sub 0, h sub 1. h sub 0 always has the equality. So it depends on where the equality is, which one is going to be h sub 0. Would you like an example? Yeah. Just one person wants an example? Anybody else want an example? Yeah, yeah. yeah all right. That's like five of you. 
<laughs> Five people want examples. Yeah, you of course you want some examples. You have no idea what you're doing right now. Uh, so here's our examples. I'm going to give you a claim. We're going to do several things with it. First thing, we're going to identify whether we are talking about proportions or means. That's the two scenarios you deal with at this point in the class is proportions and means. Later on, when we get to the last day of school, last two days of school, we'll talk about uh, variance or standard deviation. We'll talk about that. For right now, you have only two options. It's either a proportion or it's a mean. You got it? That's it. So you identify that first. Secondly, we'll translate this claim into symbolic notation. So like with equal signs or greater than or less than. And then we'll determine which one is h sub 0 and which one is h sub 1 after we write both the claim and the opposite. So here's our, our first statement. Remember, I'm giving this to you step by step. This is the first step in doing hypothesis testing. This is number one, what you do right off the bat. So here's the statement. The mean of fluid is at least 12 ounces in a can. If you're a soda manufacturer, you might want to actually test that claim, right? Because you want to be giving people less than 12 ounces in their soda can because they're going to be mad. You ever open a can and go, well, it's half gone already. Oh, it sucked, right? So they want to make sure that they're giving people at least 12 ounces to fill that can. You, you with me on that? So that's their claim. Firstly, you've got to understand whether we're dealing with a proportion or a, a, a mean. What are we dealing with here? Does it say anything about most or give a proportion or percentage or anything? Does it say mean? No. Hey, there's a clue, right? We're dealing with the mean. So it says the mean of fluid, or the average level of fluid is at least, average volume of fluid is at least 12 ounces in a can. What we're going to do is we're going to state the claim. So on every single hypothesis test you do, you're going to write this. You're going to write claim, and you're going to write opposite. You write claim and you write opposite. This is non-negotiable. Remember how I tell you sometimes if you don't do it this way, you're probably going to get it wrong? Yeah. And some of you listen to me and some of you don't. The ones who listen to me, you get it right. The ones who don't listen to me, you, you always get it wrong. All right? This is one of those things where you have to do it the way I tell you. Only way this stuff works. Right? So follow these steps and verbatim. Do them exactly the same way I'm doing them and you're going to be okay. So first thing we do, we have to state the claim symbolically. So you just determine that you're talking about... A, what was it, a mean or a proportion? Mm -hmm. Are you going to use the letter P or the letter mu? Mm -hmm. What these statements are about, by the way, I hope you understand this, these statements are about populations. What we're doing this in this chapter is taking samples, using that as evidence to test a claim about a population. Why would we want to test a claim about a sample? You have all the information about the sample. You don't even need to make a claim. You have everything there. Does that make sense to you? What you don't have is information about a population. So what this says is use your evidence to confirm or reject some statement about a population. Do you get the picture here? I hope you get the picture here. Do you get the picture here? So we're, we're testing claims about populations. So these claims are all going to be based on population parameters. That's P, that's mu, that's sigma, that's not x bar, that's not p hat that's not S. Are you seeing the difference? Those would be sample stuff that we already have all the information for. So we're testing a claim about a, a mean. What letter do we use then? Mu. 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 Okay, now you've got to translate the mean of fluid is at least 12 ounces in a can. Does this mean at least? No. That means is. That's equals to. How would you say at least? At least? At least? Yes. Is there a difference between those? Yes. That, you know what, that's going to be the key point in finding out the, these, these claims. Is can you determine this thing appropriately for your claim? If you put this, you're going to get the wrong answer. It's that big of a deal. So you need to know what at least, at most, more than, greater than, less than, all those things are going to mean as far as inequalities go. If I say I have at least 12 ounces, that means I could have 12 or more. Does that make sense? That gives you that equality right there. Now, that's all you have to do to translate your statement 
into your claim. This is your claim. The mean of fluid is at least 12 ounces. Mean, at least 12 ounces. How many feel okay with that so far? Good, all right. You okay with the claim? Now state the opposite of the claim. You're going to have exactly the same numbers and letters. So mu is mu, 12 is 12. You just have to state the opposite part of it. What, what's the opposite of that? Wait, say it again. It's less than. Less than like that? Is this the opposite? No. Notice how you have equals two places. That can't happen. That cannot happen. So if you have greater than or equal to, the opposite of that is strictly less than. So we state the claim, and then we state the opposite. I need a, a nod of heads if, if you, you're okay with that so far. Are you sure? That's a big, that's a big step. That's step number one is just doing this. Do you got it? Now, now's the part where you identify which one of these statements is h sub 0 and which one is h sub 1. Now, they, it could be either one here, depending on what these symbols are, all right? It, it, there's no rule that says, oh, your claim is always h sub 0. It's not. There's no rule that says your claim is always h sub 1. It depends on how it's worded. Notice that, oh, well, I'll show this in a second, okay? I need you to notice where the equals is. Where's the equals? Is it in the claim or the opposite of our claim? It's in the claim. It's in the claim. Wherever your equals is, that is your h sub 0. So have you identified which one is your h sub 0? Is it the claim or the opposite? The claim. So wherever your equals is, that's your h sub 0. And you're going to slightly restate it. So your idea is you write the claim, you write the opposite in symbols. You identify where your equals is. You're going to have an equal somewhere. It has to be there. It's either going to be here or in the opposite. You're going to rewrite this mu. This is something that's kind of new in statistics. They didn't always do this. Sometimes they left this symbol the way it is. However, in, in this the kind of modern era of statistics, what we do is wherever you have the equals, you're going to completely omit the greater than. You don't care about that. What you, what you really want to show is equals 12. Yes, you're looking for the mean that's greater than or equal to 12, but according to statistics, we're going to make that equals 12. That way we don't get confused on a later step. I'll show you why when we get to that later step. But you, right now, you just got to buy into this right now. Identify your claim and your opposite. Wherever your equals is, just write equals. Can you do that for me? Yes, no? The other one, you leave it exactly like it is. In this case, h sub 1 has no equals. We write mu less than 12. So just a, a very small recap. You read a claim, you identify whether you're dealing with proportions on one hand or means on the other hand. That's p or that's mu. Here we're dealing with a, a mu. You write the claim in some... Uh, symbolic notation, we got that right here. You write the opposite of the claim. You have to be very good at that, don't you? Then we translate this, which one is h sub 0, which one is h sub 1. You look for the equals. This has the equals. That means my claim is h sub 1. I just rewrite it without this greater than or equal to, just with the equal to. That's just the formality of writing statistics in this age. Okay? That's what we do. Uh, some other books, older books, don't have that. The opposite in this case was our h sub 1 because we have no equality statement. There's only been an equality statement on one of these, these pieces here. So we just simply rewrite it as h sub 1. We have mu is less than 12. Raise your hand if you're okay with this so far. Now, notice something. That's good. That's everybody. Notice something. If I didn't have at least, if I had more than, if I had more than, that wouldn't be there. Do you see that? That would actually be here. Does that make sense? That would no longer be h sub 0. That would be h sub 1, and that would be h sub 0. You with me? Do you remember me saying that um, in order to prove a claim right, it's got to be stated as h sub H sub 1. It's going to be said H sub 1. It's got to be said H sub 1. Because you're, you're trying to prove H sub 0 wrong, and that, that statement proves H sub 1 correct. This statement, our claim, is H sub 0. We're never going to be able to prove that right. We'd never be able to prove it equal to 12. 
it's impossible, you can't do it. Not with statistics, okay? So we, we wouldn't a actually ever be able to prove that claim. It's stated incorrectly for us to prove it. If we wanted to say that the fluid is greater than 12 ounces, we could prove or disprove that statement. But we can't prove it equal to 12 ounces. That would be stated incorrectly. If you wanted to prove that statement right. Do you guys get, kind of get the picture? All right, let's try a couple more. We'll try three more. Of course, I really need you to get this before we move on, right? Because if you don't get this, you're stuck. Uh, there's no way you can get any further. So let's try a few more of these things. Let's say uh, the proportion of male CEOs is greater than 0.5. Proportion of male CEOs is greater than point 0.5. I also want to show you this in this example, that's why I give this one. The proportion of male CEOs is greater than 0.5. Are we dealing with proportions or means? Proportion. Clearly because it says proportion up there. But check this out. What if I worded it a little bit different? You should still be able to see that we're dealing with proportions. I could word it like this. Most CEOs are male. Right there. You're going to see that a lot. What's most mean? More than what? Half. Half is 50% or 0.5. Are you with me on that? So most CEOs are males means this right here. The proportion of male CEOs is greater than 0.5. So if you ever see most, most means more than 50%. Are you, are you clear on that? Most means the proportion is more than or greater than 0 0.50, 50%, 0.50. Okay, well, you've already determined that we're dealing with a proportion. So are we dealing with mu still or with p? So we need to identify our claim and our opposite. Let's start with the claim first. We always start with the claim. What's, what's actually given to us? So the proportion of male CEOs is greater than 0.5. What letter are we using again? P. Because we're dealing with a... Good. And we're trying to make a statement about the population proportion. P. Can you write proportion of male CEOs is greater than 0.5, how would you write it? Would it be an equal to, a greater than or equal to, a less than or equal to, a greater than or a less than? Which would you pick? There's only several, there's, there's a few options here, right? You could do equal to, not equal to. Greater than, less than. Greater than, equal to, or less than, equal to. There's six options that you have. Now, only one's the correct option, but those are the six symbols you'll be using. Which one was it? Okay. Greater than what? Point five zero because this means most. You need to be really good at reading this or reading this and getting this. Most CEOs are male. Hey, most. More than 50% are male. That should have you okay with that one so far. Yeah? All right. Now, can you write the opposite of that claim? Oh, what are you going to put? Less than or what? Oh, there's got to be equality somewhere, right? There has to be an equality somewhere because H sub 0 has the equality. It's got to be somewhere. In our case, which is the H sub 0, the claim or the opposite? So notice how it changes. It's not the same all the time, right? This one in, in this case, this is H sub 0. This one is H sub 1. Let's rewrite h sub 0 first. h sub 0 has the equality. The equality is right here, so we write what, what now? P. P. Good. We kind of ignore this part once we find the equality. We just write equals to make it a simplified version of, of this, uh, this scenario. Now, as far as h sub 1, we don't change that ever. h sub 1 stays exactly the same. It doesn't have an equals to it. P greater than 0.50. Notice how your claim, listen, how your claim is your h sub 1. Here's how this would work. We're going to be stating h sub zeros and trying to prove them wrong. If we, tr if we prove our h sub 0 wrong, we prove our h sub 1 
right. Does that make sense? If we prove our h sub 1 right, look what we just proved. We just proved our claim. Do you see how that would prove our statement if we state our claim as h sub 1? No? Yes. Iffy? Some people are iffy. The only thing you can do is disprove h sub 0. That's all this whole process does is disprove h sub 0. You can either disprove it or fail to disprove it. Failing to disprove something doesn't prove it right. It's like guilty versus not guilty. You can find it guilty, disprove it. Or you can find it not guilty, fail to disprove it. Guilty means they got caught and they're, they're punished, right? Not guilty doesn't mean they didn't do it, there's just not enough evidence. Do you see the difference there? That's what you can do with h sub 0. You're going to be testing h sub 0. So if you test h sub 0 and find it wrong, that means h sub 1 is right. If you can find h sub 1 right, that means you prove this statement. If your statement's set up as your claim, you just proved your claim. Compare that to this. Remember, you can only test h sub 0, not h sub 1. So let's say you tested h sub 0. If you found it wrong, your whole claim is completely wrong, right? You didn't prove that statement at all. This is your claim. If you found it not wrong, did you find it right? You said nothing. You didn't say anything about that. Found it wrong, you proved this, how that your statement was wrong. It's what you were trying to prove is completely incorrect. That's not good. Right? But if, you, if you're trying to prove the statement correct, well, you can't do it here. There's never going to be enough evidence to prove something right, just like there's never enough evidence to prove someone innocent. Can you ever prove someone innocent? No. It's either they're guilty or not guilty. Here, you'd have not guilty, sure, but it doesn't prove it right. It doesn't mean that they actually didn't do it. It just means there wasn't enough evidence to say that they did. Do you see the difference between these two things? I sure hope that you do, because that's a, a really an important piece of information. That's how hypothesis testing works. Are there any questions on it before we get going? If you're not clear on it, now is a perfect time for questions. We've got time. So if you do all the math, right, and for the first one, and you figure out that the mean is actually like 11 ounces, but we're looking for, for exactly 12, basically, right? Yes. But, but if, we, if we find out it's actually 11 ounces, it, and we're looking for 12 or greater. Then it wouldn't prove this wrong. So what would we? Nothing. That's the point. Right? It doesn't tell you anything. But we, but we know that it. Now, let me say this. You're looking for this, right? If you said the mean of fluid is exactly 12 ounces in a can, that would be equals. This would be not equals. But still, wouldn't say anything about that. You'd have to test the claim. The mean fluid is different than 12 ounces. You have to test that claim. That way, you could prove the opposite correct or incorrect. Uh, sorry, you could prove the opposite incorrect. That would that would prove your claim for you. You can never prove anything about h sub zero. You can only prove things about h sub one by disproving h sub zero. That's the whole idea. I know it's reverse logic, right? Because we're we're used to going, oh, we want to prove this. We're going to go directly at it, hammer at it. Nope, not with statistics. You go like a, a backdoor approach. You state it kind of what you don't want. You state the opposite, and you go about uh, disproving your, your h sub 0 to prove that claim. It's a weird way of doing it, right? It's like an indirect proof in mathematics. Did that answer your question? The 11 won't do anything here. Sure, it is, but it's not what you asked. This is only gonna, going to uh, work with what you specifically ask it. That's it. That's why we have to ask the right questions to get the right answers. You guys ever seen iRobot? Yes. Mm -hmm. And at one point he goes, ah, now that's the right answer. And then it shuts off. And you're like, oh, come on, jerk. That's the right answer. Give me an answer. <laughs> well, that, that's kind of how this works, right? If you don't ask the right question, or he says, that's the right question. He doesn't give an answer. If you don't ask the right question, you're not going to get the right answer. That's what this whole thing is about. Okay, the mean weight of betas. <laughs> mean weight of betas is at most eight point nine lumps. Pounds. 
The mean weight of babies is 8.9 pounds. I have no idea if that's true. I think I just made it up. That's a pretty big baby. Smaller than my turkey. <laughs> my turkey was worth like three babies. Okay, of course we're going to try to state the claim and state the opposite of the claim. So, first thing you have to be good at is identifying whether you're dealing with a portion or a mean. Which are we dealing with here? Mean. Definitely mean. So you're talking about, remember, population stuff, parameter, mean or p. Plus not p hat, not x bar. Bless you. The reason is you already know everything about x bar. You're going to know that stuff. It's a sample, right? You, you, you're able to take samples. You, what you don't know about is population stuff. These claims are about populations. Now, the mean weight of babies is at most 8.9 pounds. So I know I'm going to have a mean. I know I'm going to have 8.9. You just need to know whether it's equal to, greater than or equal to, less than or equal to, greater than or less than. What is it? At most 8.9 pounds. At most. We, we deal, we, we certainly understand that the mean has to be less, it could be less than 8.9, right? Now, is there, it equals or not? That's the key. Yeah. If you have at most $9, you could have $9 and be okay, right? If you have most 8.9 pounds, it could be equal to. At most includes that equality. That's important because that dictates what your h sub 0 is and what your h sub 1 is. This is one of the most important steps you can do. After that, state the opposite. What's the opposite of mu is less than or equal to 8.9? Strictly greater than. You can't ever have an equal in two spots. Okay, which one is our h sub 0, the claim or the opposite? Which one? Yeah, because the equal sign's right there. We're going to say h sub 0. We'll just simply rewrite it. You're going to write what? Wherever the equality is, you omit that sign. You just put an equal sign. H sub 1, we don't change anything about that ever. Mu is greater than 8.9. Tell me something. Would we be able to prove our claim correct in this case? Would we be able to, after we did all the work, prove our claim correct here? What do you think? Why? Can you ever prove H sub 0 right? No. Our claim is stated as H sub 0. All you can do is prove that wrong. So you wouldn't be able to prove this claim ever. You can't prove right. You could prove wrong, but that is not what you're trying to do. That's not what the statement asks. So when you get to doing this on your own, you better make sure you state your, your claim is correct, right? Now these claims are going to be given to you. You're not going to have to do that in your homework or your test. But if you, when you get out to real life and you want to actually do this, which happens uh, in a lot of jobs and a lot of fields, if you're ever asked to do research on something, you are going to be doing statistics because it deals with samples. Uh, you better state your claims correctly, otherwise you're never going to be conclusive on them. That's not good. Okay, last example before we get on into something just a little bit different, our second step in hypothesis testing. So, last one. I'm going to have you, uh, you do this on your own. by piece. First thing you're going to do is look for your claim. So I want you to identify on your own whether you're dealing with a proportion or a mean. Usually it's pretty obvious what you're dealing with. And write down the appropriate symbol. <coughs> now, bless you, now with that statement Write down mean is equal to, or greater than or equal to, or not equal to, or less than or equal to, or greater than or less than 100, because that's the value you're given. So you should have mean, and you should have 100, and you should have some symbol between there. What symbol is it? Equals. Is means equals. Sure. Now you've got to write the opposite of that statement. So you should still have the mu. And the 100, what's the opposite of equals? Not equals? Good. That's okay. We can have that. We can have that. 
What this means is, is actually probably the question that they should have asked on the, uh, the soda can one. They don't want it more than 12 ounces, or they don't want it less than 12 ounces, but they also don't want it more, right? They want it exactly equal to 12 ounces. You'd probably test the claim. The claim would be the mean volume of soda is not equal to 12 ounces, then you could actually prove it right or wrong. <clears throat> hey, which one of these is the H sub zero? Do we have to rewrite anything? That's kind of nice, right? We, we don't really have to change anything about this. We're just going to say that mu is equal to 100. Mu is not equal to 100. You'll notice that if h of 0 is stated as our claim, we also wouldn't be able to prove that one correct. You'd have to prove things like the mean IQ score is not equal to 100, or the mean IQ score is uh, greater than something, or less than something. Those at most, those at least, those things aren't provable. They include the equality. Not great for us. Okay, now we're going to move on to something. Do you feel okay with stating these claims the opposite and determining which one is h of zero and h of one? How many of you feel pretty good about that? Good. Okay. Good. The next thing you do after you do your claim. So this is step number one. No matter what you do, exactly this way, you've got to find what's called the test statistic. The test statistic, hopefully the name implies, is what you use to test the hypothesis. Now there's a couple, there's actually three we'll be dealing with. I'll give you two of them today, one of them later on when we get back to uh, standard deviation. You have two different test statistics. One is for a proportion. P and one is for the mean, mu. For the proportion, for the proportion, oh, this is going to be great for you. Let's go back to your test, chapter seven. For proportions, did you have an option between Z or T, or was it all of one of them? For proportions. It was always Z for proportions, you remember that? Always Z. For proportions, you're still going to have a Z test statistic. Notice, please watch this on the board. Do you notice there's no alpha over 2? This is not a critical value. This is different. This is a test statistic. It is a typical Z score like what you've done before. A typical Z score like what you've done before is a sample measure minus a population parameter over the standard deviation over the square root of n. That's it. Okay, one big thing. Big, big thing here. Please note very carefully that this right here, that, that P and that Q, I'm going to make sure I can double check this for you. Right in your, right on your table too. That P and your that Q, do those have a hat on them? So are, is this P the same as this P? Is this P the same as this P? Yes. These P's are the same. So this is going to come from your claim. This right here is the only thing, and this right here is the only thing that comes from your sample. Is that information? You okay with this one? It's a z-score. It's just called test statistic. Test statistic. Now. Now, now mean, we had two options for mean. We had a Z. When did you use a Z, folks? When did you use a Z? Well, of clearly four proportions, but when you talk about means, when did you use a Z? Wow, okay. Go back and read chapter seven. When did you use a T? Was there a difference between Z and T? If you didn't know there was a difference between Z and T, you got fours on a lot of your problems. Or zeros. 
on your test? Sample. Sample what? Standard deviation. Standard deviation. It was all about the standard deviation. If you knew population standard deviation, you used? Yeah, that's great. If you didn't know population, you knew the sample standard deviation and you used T. If you didn't know that, well, news to you. Why? Because a z-score is based on sigma. If you don't know sigma, how are you supposed to find z? Does that look familiar to you? Geez, I hope so. Yeah, you, you should have used that on your test, right? A z-score is x bar minus mean over the square uh, sigma divided by the square root of n. T is very similar. x bar minus mean over, but you don't know sigma, you only know s. Over the square root of n. Remember that this happens when sigma is known. This happens when sigma is not known. That's a population standard deviation. If sigma is known. Are you going to try to put a couple of these steps together? Yes, no? You okay with stating the claim, right? And opposite. We haven't done this yet, but, well, we haven't done that yet. We've done this stuff before. We, we've done all that already. Now we're just tying together some, some loose ends, putting everything together. Here's a survey. A sample of 703 companies found that 61% of CEOs were male. By the way, your, your homework problems and your test problems will all say something about a claim. You'll say, like, test the claim that blah, 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 blah. Or the claim is blah, 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 blah. It'll ask you to test some claim. I'm telling you, here's the claim. Most CEOs are men. Here's the idea for you, all right? We're, we're, getting, we're getting more into the, the process of hypothesis testing. Here's the idea. You can't just look at that and go, well, clearly. I mean, the sample said 61% were male, so clearly most are male. Well, it was a sample. It was a fairly large sample. But is it different? The question is this with hypothesis testing. Is it different enough from this, from, from this claim, or is it, is it different enough from some statement to prove it right? That's the idea. Is it different enough? Is 61% big enough to say that most are, are, are male? Would 52% be big enough? Would 51% be big enough? Would 55% be big enough? You don't know, do you? Because there's no way to just determine that. Because uh, is a sample going to reflect perfectly the population? What do you think? You're a sample of the college, right? Do you reflect perfectly the college? Clearly not. No, not even close, right? You, you, we're, we're not even a random sample. You're based on, on taking certain math courses to get here. It's not random. So you don't represent the college very well, actually. Uh, but this sample might represent the population really well, but we're not sure how well, well are we. We don't know that if, if they have 51% male, that's enough to say that, 50, that most CEOs are male. Or if they had 52% male, that was a 52 whether that says most or male, or, or 61, is that big enough? We don't know that's the process of hypothesis testing. You're going to see, is 61% big enough to say that most CEOs are male? Do you get the idea? Are you, you starting to get the idea? I hope so. Well, we're going to go through at least the first two steps here. So, claim. Okay, don't get tri 
backed up with with all the, the fancy wording and stuff like that. Your claim is based on where it says claim. That's it. It's going to say claim somewhere. Or it's going to make a statement somewhere. Test the claim that most CEOs are male. Ladies and gentlemen, are you working with a proportion or a mean here? Proportion. Definitely proportion. Absolutely right. So you're going to put B. <laughs> Remember, we're working with the claim most CEOs are male. So, claim is P is, what is that, greater than, greater than, equal to, equal to, not equal to, less than, less than or equal to, what do you think? How would you state your claim, most? Most? Most. What do you think? If you have most of the pie, do you have exactly half the pie? Do you have more than half the pie? What do you think? You, you all had pie, right? Pumpkin pie is amazing on Thanksgiving. If you didn't, it's un-American, whatever. <laughs> if you have half, exactly half the pie, did you have most of the pie? No, you didn't have most. Because someone else had half the pie, you had equal shares, didn't you? If you have most of the pie, you have like a little bit more than 50%, don't you? That's a little bit more than 50%. You need to know that most means more than. You have to know that. You got that? Most is more than 50%. That says most CEOs are male. More than 50% of the, the CEOs are male. Are you clear on that? Now, why don't I have this? Why don't I have that? Does that have to do with my claim? No. Look at the difference. The claim is based on a population, right? We're trying to say a general statement about an entire group of American companies that says most are male. This right here, that's our evidence. We're going to use that to confirm or deny our claim. You with me? That's the idea. So the 61%, that will come in later, but not now. Right now, I have only my claim. That's all I'm worried about. The proportion is greater than... 50% or 0.50. Raise your hand feel okay with that so far. Yes, no? Yes, okay. State the opposite. Go ahead. The opposite is going to be less than or equal to. Got to have an equality somewhere. Did you catch the equals to? Which one is my h sub 0, the claim or the opposite right now? Good. And do you use the symbol again? No. What do you use? Okay, this is old news now. We've, we've done this uh, five times. How many people feel okay with doing, doing that? You need to know most, right? You need to know what most means. The proportion means more than 50%. Now, the next thing we're going to do is the t this is step number one. Next thing we do is the test statistic. Will we be using a z-score or a t-score and why? Z-score, yeah, absolutely. Why is z-score? Why is z-test statistic? Yeah, proportions. That's the only one we got for proportions, right? There was no t over here. So let's look at the letters that we need to know for z. We've got an old p hat. Hey, look at the problem. Can you identify a p hat? p hat was a sample proportion. Did that give you a sample proportion? What was it? 61% or 0.61. Do we have a P now? Does it say, this is why we do this. You probably were, were thinking, why do we put the equals to? Why do we put the equals to? Where's the equals to coming? Does it say P equals something up there right now? No. Yes, it does. Oh, up there right now. Yeah. It, does. it says P. I, I know, I saw I wrote it. I wrote that on the board. Does it say P equals to? Yeah. What's P equal to? There you go. That's why you put the equals to. Do you get it now? That gives you P. Could you find Q? Yeah. And do you know N? Very good. So list those things out. P hat in our case is 0.61. We know that because it said from a sample. P hat means from a sample. It's a sample proportion. P comes from your H sub 0. P comes from your H sub 0. It's right there. 
If your P is 50% or 0 0.50, what's your Q? Is it 0.39? Is it coming from your P hat? No, these two things work together. Do you remember how to find your Q from your P? Take that one minus. And last thing we need to know is, is just our N. Our N is our sample size. In this case, it's what? Now you're going to go ahead and find your test statistic. It's a z-score. It's a z-test statistic. So you get your 0.61 minus 0 0.50 all divided by. Point five zero goes there, point five zero goes here, divided by the square divided by seven oh six, we take the square root after that. <coughs> I hear the rustle of calculators it makes me happy. The top number you should do first. Do that operation, do 0.61 minus 0.50, because you won't have to round it very much. It's not a big operation. You're going to get 0.11. Did you get 0.11? Hope so. Now, the bottom one. Do this on your calculator like I tell you. You ready? Don't round anything. Take 0 0.50 times 0 0.50, press enter. You're going to get 0.25. Yeah? Divide by 706, press enter. I have no idea what you're going to get, but it's going to be small. That's why you don't round. Do you have some like 0, 0 stuff? Okay. Now, take a square root of that. All you got to do is press square root and then press answer, wherever your answer button is. Usually you have to press a second or a shift button to get there. Press enter. It gave you something like that? Now, press 0.11 divided by answer. And it will give you five point something. Do you give five point something? If you weren't able to get that in your calculator, come and see me. I'll show you how to do that later, all right? But on your calculator right now, you should have, oh, I have no idea what it is. I have to think of. 5.83. Did you get 5.83? 5.84. 5 5.84? Oh, my math is wrong. Five point, so this is same stuff. You rounded correctly, 5.84? 5.84. Okay, so very short recap. We have a claim. We have some statement. We write it as the claim and the opposite. We translate both into symbolic notation. We write 1 as a sub 0 if it includes equal sign. We just write equals. Why do we write equals? It gives us an equality we can use in just a second. The other one we don't change at all. This is going to tell us right here, I'll give you a little, little precursor, on whether you have a right tail, a left tail, or a two tail test. That's going to be very important for us in a little while. After that, we use all that information to find a test statistic. What this does, this is a very important piece for us, is tests our claim. Now, you have to know whether 5.84 is a usual value or an unusual value. Is 5.84 usual or unusual for a z-score? Do you remember the range of usual values for z-scores? Negative 2 to 2 is usual. If it's in that range, it's usual. That's the rule of thumb. Is that usual? That's way out there, right? Listen, here's the whole idea. If this is rare enough, Please watch on the board here real quick. If this is rare enough, it means that our h sub 0 is wrong. If our h sub 0 is wrong, it means our h sub 1 is right, and we just proved our claim. Does that make sense to you? Now, the problem is we don't know what rare enough means. Okay, Is this rare enough? Is it not rare enough? We don't know. We're now going to incorporate the idea of significance level. That was the Chapter 7 idea. Remember significance level? It was like you were 95% confident meant the significance level was 0 0.05. 99% meant 0 0.01 for significance level. We're going to incorporate that into that idea. That's going to tell us, well, if you only need to be 90% certain of it, no problem. You can test certain hypotheses and, and get away with it. But if you need 99%, well, we're going to tell now how certain we are about our hypothesis testing. That's going to be that. Okay, so from last time, we...
have already stated our claim. We stated the opposite of the claim. That's always your first step. We made one of them h sub 0, one of them h sub 1. Of course, the h sub 0 has the equality. The h sub 1 doesn't. It has this thing that doesn't have the equality. It could be either the claim or the opposite, depending on how the statement is worded. After that, we went and made our test statistic. It's, for proportions, a z-score, which is why we get that z equal 5.84. But we were, we were trying to make a decision on whether this was good enough evidence to reject our null hypothesis. Whether this made this one false and therefore this one true, or whether this was, wasn't good enough, wasn't rare enough, and therefore we couldn't say anything about that one. So that's where we're at right now. In order to do that, we've got to learn how to make a decision. So that's where we're going to start today. So how to make a decision. I don't mean like, hmm, should I have pumpkin pie or peach pie? Not that type of decision. A decision based on your evidence and your statistics. So I guess what I was trying to say by that is a decision is not a judgment call. It's based on math. It's a math decision. Now, in order to make a decision, you've got to know what the significance level is. Now, that should be familiar because we've already talked about the significance level. It went back to the confidence intervals. Remember confidence intervals? Mm -hmm. We had that alpha. Remember the alpha? Yeah. I hope you do. It was a complement to your confidence level. It was called the significance level. So we're going to have a significance level. Just like before, it's given by alpha. Now, do you remember the common alphas? The common alphas? No, those would be the critical values. Those would be the z's. I'm not talking about the z's. I'm talking about the alpha. Point 0.1 was a common one, right. That had to do with the 90 percent. So 0 0.10 is an alpha. Remember, this, these are the complements to your, your confidence levels from chapter 7. What's another one? 0 0.05. That was going with a 95% confidence level. Remember doing that? So 0 0.05 was another one. And what was the last one? Zero. Now, do they have to be 0 0.1, 0 0.05, or 0 0.01? No, they could be anything you want. These are going to be the most common ones, though. Those are typically what you see. This one is by far the most common that you have. You usually deal with a 5% confidence <coughs> significance level, usually. Now, we're still going to have critical values. Critical values were from Chapter 7 as well. So we still have that. So critical values. Only this time, the critical values are going to separate what we're going to call the rejection region from the fail to reject region. I might have mentioned that before, but it didn't make a whole lot of sense back in Chapter 7 because we never really worked with it. Now we get to work with it. So a critical value separates what we're going to call the rejection region from the fail to reject region. Why is it important now? Hey, we're trying to reject a claim now, right? We're trying to reject H sub 0. So if, it fall, if the z-score, our test statistic, falls in the rejection region, we reject. If it doesn't, we fail to reject. That's it. That's a decision that's based on mathematics. So critical values are pretty important for us. Uh, they're going to separate the rejection region from the fail to reject region. So we're going to be finding our critical values the same way that, that we would before. So if you have an alpha of 0 0.05, if we're talking about a right tail test, your z critical value is 1.645. Do you remember how to find those? We look at the 0 0.05 on the table, it's going to give us 1.645. 
actually would give you negative, but if we're talking about right tail tests, we'll talk about right, left, and two tail tests in just a minute, but for right now, stick with me. These are found the same way. Now, here's what the rejection region does. We just spoke about the value, the critical value that separates the rejection region from the failed to reject region. It's the region that if our test statistic falls in that area, we get to reject the null hypothesis. That's called the rejection region. If you fall in the fail to reject region, well then your test statistics in that area, it's saying you don't have enough evidence to reject the null hypothesis. This is, the rejection region, it's actually, it sounds bad, right? You don't want to be in the rejection region. That's like high school for me, I was in the date rejection region off in high school. That's okay. But, but now, it's good to be in the rejection region because that means you have enough evidence to overturn your null hypothesis and prove your other one right. So the rejection region here is not a bad thing, it could be a good thing. Prove your statements. So this is the region that if our test statistic falls into, we get to reject the null hypothesis. test statistic falls into this region, you reject H sub 0 middle hypothesis. Okay, let me show you how this is going to work. Now, you're not going to be able to get this this far yet. I'm going to show you how to figure out the type of picture I'm going to draw here in just a moment. But here's how this particular problem, remember the problem we were dealing with last time, right? This is a continuation of that. It was this information. Here's how this would look. You're still going to be drawing this picture. It's the same picture all the time. I'm going to show you in a moment how to determine that this is a right tail test. I'll, I'll prove to you in just a second that this is going to be a right tail test. Here's how you do it. First thing you do is you look at your, your alpha. So let's assume that we're dealing with a 0 0.05 significance level. That's giving me a critical value of 1.645. So remember, zeros here, 1.645 will be right there. This is my critical val value. Write that down in your paper. This is a critical value. <coughs> now, what that critical value does that we wrote up here, it separates the rejection region from the fail to reject region. Here's the separation. The area in the tails is the area that is your rejection region. So in here, this is the fail to reject region. Here, the tail, that's your rejection region. So this tail right here represents 0 0.05 as a proportion of, of your area right here. That's how we found our 1.645. We would look up the 0.05. It's going to give us a critical value of 1.645. We put that on our, our paper. This is the rejection region. This would be the fail to reject region. So just an overall little recap of how you do hypothesis testing. You're, you're there. You're, you're almost there. We're, we're about ready to do it. There's only one piece of information I need to tell you, then we'll be good to go. Rock solid. Here's what you do. First thing, you state your claim. You state the opposite. You determine which one has the equal sign. That's going to be your h of 0, your null. You determine which one doesn't, that's going to be h sub 1, your alternative. You always state your h sub 0 with an equal sign. That's how you get the value for your test statistic when you create your z-score. Now notice that on your paper, you have two z-scores, don't you? You have one that's a critical value, and you have one that is a test statistic. Are you, you following me on this? Your critical value is what you put on your paper. Your critical value is called the traditional method is put on your paper, that separates the rejection region from the failed to reject region. Your test statistic, that number that you created that's based on your comparison between your samples data and your population uh, hypothesis, gives you that number. This is what you test. Well, it's called a test statistic. It's what you're testing against your critical value. So you compare these two numbers. You compare the 1.645 
and you compare the 5.84. You look where the 5.84 is in relation to the 1.645. Does it fall in the fail to reject region or the rejection region? Can you tell? It's a number line. Where's 5? Is it here? This is negative. Where's 5? Is it here? It's like, it's like here. It's like here, actually. It's way over there. Is that in the failed to reject region or the rejection region? Rejection. Definitely rejection region. That tells you you are going to reject your null hypothesis. You'd say, this one's wrong, this one's right. Oh yeah, I just proved my claim. That's how you make a decision. So it's, it's based on lots of information. It's an it's a involved process. These problems don't go quickly. They go slowly. You have to really work at it. There's seven steps to doing it. I'll show you all those seven steps as we keep going. <clears throat> now, what you also need to know is that your critical value will change depending on whether you have a left tail, a right tail, or a two tail test. But we're focusing on this. This is an important part for you, okay? You can't just memorize these numbers anymore. They're going to change sporadically uh, as, as you talk about a different situation. So let's go ahead. Let's see if we can, if we can figure out one of these examples. So say my alpha is 0 0.05, that's my significance level. I'll give you three cases. I'm going to change this a bit, but it's coming from, coming from here. Let's suppose that I had different H sub 1s, different alternative hypotheses. These are the ones that tell you whether you're going to be a left tail, a right tail, or a two tail <coughs> test. I'll make it very explicit in a moment. But here's our situations. Let's say that P was less than. Point five. If this this point five is not that point five. Okay, I'm going back to this proportion being less than fifty percent. Oh, I just jumped away. These are the only cases you can possibly have for an alternative hypothesis. Remember, the H sub 1s, those are the ones that don't have the equal sign. They're either going to be greater than, less than, or not equal to. So you'd have like H sub 1, or this H sub 1, or this one. Now here's how you determine what picture it is in every single case. It's always going to be standard normal curve. And of course we'll have zero in the middle. But you need to know whether we're talking about a right tail test, a left tail test, or a two tail test. It's not always the same. So when we're looking at this thing, if you're talking about the proportion less than a certain value, less, where's less than? Is it to the left or to the right? Less than is to the left of something. So if you have a, a less than, see how the arrow's pointing to the left? You see that? You're talking about a left tail test on that. The arrow's pointing that way. The arrow's pointing that way, isn't it? If you make a little arrow out of that. If your H sub 1 says less than a certain value, you will have a left <coughs> tail test. This is the one we actually did over there. This was a right tail test. The reason why it was a right tail test, why I knew that, I said, okay, we're trying to say that proportion is big, bigger than a certain value. If it's big enough, it means it proved it right. So we're going to make a little stop over here for a right tail test. You see, what this is doing is saying, is it rare enough to prove this true? Is it, for, is it small enough, is it smaller enough than 50% to say yes, that's, this is accurate? Or in other words, h sub, h sub 0 is wrong. So this would be to the left of that, that value. This is smaller than 50%. Does that make sense to you? The right tail test says the other thing. It says, well, it has to be bigger than by a certain margin. And that margin is given, us, given to us by our significance level. So here, left tail test here, it's pointing to the right. It says a right tail test, bigger than a certain value. That's over to the right. How about this one? What's the not equal to? What do you think? It can't be left and it can't be right. Hmm? Well, we've got to have a tail somewhere. Do you understand the idea of the less than and the greater than? You have to get these two before you can get this one. 
some of you guys aren't, aren't, aren't really getting, let me go over it one more time, that way you, you really get it. You better kind of focus in on this. It's the last time we'll do it. Um, what you're trying to do in these situations is you're trying to prove this one right. If you have enough evidence, it would say that the proportion is less than 50%. It'd be far, farther enough to the left, farther enough or small enough to say that, that this is true. Basically, that h sub 0 would be wrong. It's the only way you'd be able to prove that. But the, the to the left idea is saying, okay, we're looking for, for values that are smaller than some, some number. Here, we have the opposite. We're looking for, for greater than. So we're looking for numbers that are smaller or numbers that are bigger. That's giving us a left or a right tail test. If we're not equal to, that means it could be either smaller or bigger. Does that make sense to you? Smaller or bigger says it's not a left tail test necessarily. It's not a right tail test necessarily. It's a two tail test. It could be either less than or greater than. So we get this, two tail test. Now, if our alpha is 0.05, that means the area in each tail for a two-tail test is 0 0.05. That's how you're finding your critical values. That's the way it's going to be. However, look up here at the board. Notice that all of our alpha is in this one tail. You with me? And all of our alpha is in this one tail. How much of our alpha is going to be in this tail? Good, half of it. Yeah, sure. Because now you're splitting it amongst two tails. This is why you can't memorize this number for this alpha all the time. Because if you have one tail, yes, that's what it's going to be. But if you have two tails, it's going to split it. Do you get me? It's going to be different. So with two tails, well, this is no longer 0 0.05. This is alpha over 2, or 0 0.025. This is no longer 0 0.05. This is alpha over 2 or 0 0.025. Okay. Go ahead and take your tables out for me. We're going to verify what these critical values are. So the idea is we're going to look for the number, the critical value that separates the rejection region for us. By the way, can you look at the board here real quick? Where's the rejection region? Here? Rejection region? Rejection region. Yes, it's always the area in the tail. Here, rejection region? No. Rejection region. Rejection region, oh, happens in either spot. Because we're looking for something that's equal, so the, the evidence would be it's not equal, either left or right. That's how we, we find these out. So go ahead and look at your table, take that out. What we're looking for here is the alpha in the body of your table. So look right here in the middle of your table. You'll be in a negative z-score. You'll probably be there all the time. That's okay, you just have to be smarter than your table. Okay, be smarter than the table. Look here at your alpha. These are alphas, by the way, right here. Areas, areas are alphas, alphas are areas. Look for 0 0.05, 0 0.05. Z-score, 0.05. Did you find it? It should be one of the asterisks, right? You follow it down and it tells you how much? Negative 1 point. This should be old news for you, right? You should be really clear on how to do that. Negative 1.645. Look up here at the board. We're talking about a left tail test. Left tail tests will have negative z-scores. Are you with me on that? This is a critical value of negative 1.645. That's great. It's a left tail test. Now, here's an important piece of information, right? Go to the next one. Go, don't, don't look at your table. You already know the answer. If you look at 0 0.05 here, it's going to give you negative 1.645, isn't it? Well, I hope so. You just, you just looked up 0 0.05. Were you all able to do that? You all got the negative 1.645, right? Now, if we're talking about right tail test, though, if you look up 0 0.05, notice this is talking about the area to the right. If you look up 0 0.05, your table is still going to tell you negative 1.645. Is this supposed to be negative 1.645? What is it supposed to be? Positive. Why? Well, we're on the opposite side now. So you can, you can do this two ways. Your table only gives you the area to the left. It will only look up areas to the left. So you can either look up 
0 0.05, you get negative 1.645, that's the correct way to do it. Or you can look at 0 0.05, you're still going to give you negative 1.645 and then change it to a positive. Or you can look at 0.95. That's the area to the left in this situation. Are you with me? I'll bet you a billion dollars that if you look up 0.95 on your table, it's going to give you positive 1.645. You want to take that bet? No. Because it's symmetrical. It's perfectly symmetrical. So be smarter than your table, be smarter than this, this information, and know that if I'm talking about a right tail test, even if I look up 0 0.05, I should have a positive value there. Raise your hand if you feel okay with that. Okay, so this is a critical, did you raise your table at me? You raised your, that's awesome. <laughs> 1.645. Do you get it? I get it. On the table. All right. Now, the most important question up here is, is this still going to be negative 1.645 and 1.645? No, you've essentially cut your alpha in half. So that's why you can't memorize this. You actually have to go through and do these pictures and know what you're talking about. What value are you going to look up now? 0 0.025. Look that up for me right now. Go ahead and do that. This, by the way, is why I put question number two in your last test, seeing if you were able to look up 0 0.10. Most of you weren't. So this would be a good time to remedy that situation. So if you can't do that, you're not going to pass this class. Were you able to find it? You should be looking up 0 0.0250. These are all four decimal numbers. So 0 0.025 is not going to be exactly on your, your paper. 0 0.0250 might be, or if it's not, it probably has an asterisk because it's a very common value. What did it give you? 1.9, let me see, 1.96, okay. So I'm looking, I'm looking for point zero. Oh, there it is, 0 0.0250, it's listed right there for me, I'm seeing negative 1.96. How many people were able to find negative 1.96? Good for you, that's fantastic, okay. Now, is this the negative one or is this the negative one? The left or the right? So we have one critical value of negative 1.96. Hey, how about this one? What, what do you think that one's going to be? Positive. Just positive, yeah. It's a, a symmetrical chart, which is nice. So this right here, this tells you where your rejection region is. That's why our critical values are so critical. They're critical for us to know those things because that's separating our rejection regions from the fail to reject region. And that's how you make decisions with hypothesis testing. You look to see where this number falls, your test statistic. If it falls in your rejection regions, you reject. If it doesn't, well, then you don't. So let's go through each case. Look up here on the board with me. 5.84. Is it in the rejection region or the fail to reject region for this? It's way over here, correct? <coughs> this is my rejection region. You would fail to reject in this case. How about this one, reject or not? Reject. Definitely reject, it's in the tail. How about this one, reject or not? Reject. Definitely reject, it's in one of the tails. This one doesn't matter which tail you're in, as long as you're in a tail. Okay, so there's three situations that we have. I'll write this out in general so you can have a not just a specific case, but something that you follow up each time. There are three types of tests. They're all determined by H sub 1, your alternative hypothesis. Three types of tests. Every single one of them is determined by H sub 1. That's where you're looking here and here and here. It can't be determined by h sub 0 because h sub 0 always has an equal sign. That, that doesn't help us out at all. It's always determined by h sub 1. There's an option for a left tail. A right tail. Or a two-tail test. It's going to look exactly like what I have on the board. I'm just writing it out in general so you see it every time. So a left tail test. If h sub 1 has this sign, 
that. Less than. If a sub 1 has less than, it will be a left tail test. Left, less, less, left. So if it has that less than, the rejection region is in the left tail. This would be alpha, this would be negative Z, a negative critical value is what that stands for. If we have the other case, if H1 has a greater than, that's going to be a right tail test saying that the rejection region is in the right tail. say, okay, the rejection region is over here, that's given by our alpha, and this will be a positive critical value, a positive Z. So for left tail, for either case, you look up your alpha, right? You look up your alpha all the time. So if you look up your alpha and you know it's a left tail test, you, you keep it negative. If you look up your alpha and you know it's a right tail test, you just make it positive. If you look up alpha when it's split in two, you take the negative and the positive, because that's a two tail test and that's our last one. If H sub 1, or our alternative hypothesis, has a not equal to, those are the only three options. The rejection region is in both tails, that gives us a two tail test. <coughs> However, the alpha is split amongst them. So you have half your alpha to the left, and half your alpha to the right. And that's, that's really important that we get that down. It's not the same alpha uh, that you would have in a, a left and a right tail test for the same uh, significance level. So you got two now, two critical values separating your rejection region, which is in both tails. So since it's split amongst both tails, you have your alpha divided by two for the right and same for the left. This will be a negative z and a positive z but this is based on alpha over 2, not the alpha that you had at the very beginning. This, not the significance level from the problem, but the significance level split in half. That's where that's coming from. Would you raise your hand and feel okay with these, these examples? I'm trying to make this real clear for you so you understand where this is coming from. That's why we did that one as a specific example first. There's one more definition that I've got to show you before we do any sort of uh, anything extra. This can be very confusing for people because I'm going to use another letter P. I know I've used lots of letter P's in this class, all right? The letter P I'm about to use is called a P value. It's an uppercase P. It stands for the probability. It is not based on a proportion. So this letter P is not the same as this letter P. I know that's confusing because letter P's can stand for lots of different things, all right? This P is not a proportion. A P value is a probability value. So what we're talking about right now is not a proportion. You can use a p-value type of test to, to do what we're, what we're talking about. You see, we're going to talk about two methods for hypothesis testing. The traditional, which is what I just showed you, and the p-value method, which is a slightly different way to approach it. It's becoming more and more popular. Statistics changes over time. Uh, this is becoming a more popular way to do things. So I'm going to show you both. So capital P value. Stands for a prob probability value. And what it is, it's the probability that's associated with your test statistic. Is it a proportion? No. No, 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 no. It's a probability. 
and it's associated with your test statistic. That was the 5.84 thing that we, we found out. You see, there's, I'm going to give you a little preview of what you do here. There, there's two ways to do hypothesis testing. The first way is the traditional method. What the traditional method does is this. Please, please watch carefully. I'm going to kind of explain it, give you an overview, and then I'll be much more specific as we go through the next section. Uh, the traditional method does this. It says you look at your significance level, and that's going to give you, based on a left tail, right tail, or two tail test, your critical values, right? And it separates your rejection region, either two or left or right tail. And then you look at your test statistic and you see where it falls. You follow me on that? This way, the p-value method does something a little bit backwards. It says you're not going to worry about critical values. No critical values. It says all you have is your test statistic. And you're going to put that on your chart. And you're going to find out the area in the, in that particular, for that particular value. Then you compare it directly to your significance level. If it's smaller than your significance level, you know it's rare enough to reject the, the null hypothesis. So there's two ways of looking at it. Traditional has critical values, and you look where your test statistic falls. P-value says you take your test statistic, look up the area, which you guys are very comfortable doing, you've done that before, and you compare that area to the alpha. If it's smaller, you reject. If it's not smaller, then you don't reject. That's, that's the two options you have for hypothesis testing. You need to know both, uh, so I'll teach you both. Because I'm going to ask you specifically for one method or another on your on your test. All right, so you, you do have to know both of them. So I'll let you know there's two ways to go about it. Okay, so p-value. It's a probability associated with the test statistics, and I just just talked about our decisions that we can make. Decisions. There's only there's only two options. The decisions are you reject the null hypothesis if it's in the rejection region for for the uh, traditional, or if the p-value is less than the alpha for p-value method, or you fail to reject the null hypothesis. You can't ever accept it. Those are the only two options we can have. Only two uh, decisions. They're not really decisions. You don't get to decide. It's already decided for you based on the math. You just have to be able to do the math correctly. One, if it's in the rejection region, you are going to reject H of zero, the null hypothesis. Two, if it doesn't, if it's in the fail to reject region for traditional method, you fail to reject. In this case, if you reject H sub zero, you accept H sub one. This one, if you fail to reject H sub 0, can you accept H sub 1 still? Remember, the, these statements that I have on the board, the H sub 0 and H sub 1, they're opposites. They're opposite statements, right? It means that if this one is, if you reject H sub 0, it means it's clearly false. If it's clearly false, it means this one's clearly true. If you fail to reject H sub 0, it means it's not necessarily false, but it's definitely not necessarily true. Can you say anything about H sub 1? then you, you can't say anything about anything, then you're done. There's no decision on, on this. So if you reject H sub 0, you do accept H sub 1. If you fail to reject H sub 0, you don't know anything about your statement whatsoever. You know nothing. <laughs> Love that one. Can't prove it right, can't prove it wrong. You're stuck. Now, I'm going to put on the board what I was talking about just a minute ago the traditional method versus the p value method. Here's the difference if you want to see it. Traditional method does this it will take 
in your three possible options here that we talked about on the left hand side of the board. It will take your left tail or your right tail or your two tail test. And it will give you some sort of rejection regions here. With, of course, a negative critical value or a positive critical value or two critical values. Depending on your type of test. And what the traditional method says is you take your test statistic. Look up here at the board with me. You take your test statistic. These things are not test statistics. They're critical values. You take your test statistic and you see if it falls in your rejection region. If it does, you reject H of 0. So I'll put up here, what we're doing is you are going to reject H sub 0, reject H sub 0, if the test statistic falls in the rejection region. Reject H of 0 if the test statistic falls in the rejection region, it would be here, or here, or in one of those two spots respectively. P-value method is the opposite way of looking at it. They're both equally valid. There really is not a whole lot of difference between, well there's no difference in the mathematics, it's just what you're looking up changes. P-value method says this. You compare the p-value to your alpha. So what you would have here, based on your left tail, right tail, two tail test, you would have a test statistic. And you would look up that area. This area would be your p-value. That's a weird view. That area of your p-value, so notice how the pictures, they look very similar, don't they? Only in your traditional method, these are critical values. Here, you would have a test statistic. You, should, you could still have a right tail, a left tail, or a two-tail test. But now you're looking up the area that's associated with your test statistic, that's a p-value, and then you reject your h of 0 if the p-value is less than <clears throat> or equal to alpha. fail to reject H of 0, if the p-value is greater than alpha. You see, alpha is your significance. It's how sure you want to be. So if our value, if our area is less than alpha, it says, okay, you, you, it's, pretty, it's rare enough. It, it's rare enough to say that that's to support that, that with evidence. If it's not, it's bigger than alpha, it says it's not rare enough for us. It may very well be true, but not according to how significant, how important we want to make this statement. Would you like to do an example of finding p-values? Yeah. I was hoping that you would, because I have a plan, and if you, if you didn't, I, we'd be stuck. Actually, we do it anyway, so. <laughs> Okay, so hopefully you understand the traditional method right now because we, we've actually done that. We did an example with it. Traditional method works like this. You find critical values. You already have a test statistic and you see where it falls. Do you guys have the, the traditional method down? You sure? Okay, here's the p-value method. Let's do a couple examples of finding p-value.
there's really only three things we've got to do. Uh, firstly, again, you're going to have to determine whether it's a left tail, a right tail, or two tail test. That, that's important. Second thing, we'll actually find the p-value. Third thing, we'll compare that p-value to alpha. That's the three things you do here. So let's do, we'll do two examples. Example number one. Let's say that I give you your alpha. Your alpha is 0 0.05. Okay, so it's, it's just a 0 0.05 significance level. Uh, I say that your H sub 1, by the way, do I have to give you an H sub 1? What do you think? If I don't give you an H sub 1, can you tell whether it's a left tail, two tail, or right tail, or right tail test? So do I have to give you an H sub 1? You get an H sub 1. Otherwise, you're not going to tell what type of, what type of test you're dealing with. Oh, well, let's see how good you are. Let's see how good you are. Is this P a P value? Or is that P a proportion? Are they the same? Oh, good. You get it. Yeah. P value is associated with a test statistic. That right there is, is a claim based on your proportion. I know that can get confusing because we have two different P's. But if it's an H sub 0 or H sub 1, it's talking about a proportion. All right? If it's not, if, if, you're, if you're looking up a, a Z score and you're getting an error, then that's a P value. And let's say that we're not going to do any we're not going to do any work with this. So I'm just going to give you the test statistics that I found on my own. Okay. So you do all the work and you get a test statistic. Of z equals one point one eight. So you did the work on that. Would you like to see a comparison between the p-value method and the traditional method? Would that help you out if you saw the difference between them on this one example? Because you could do this both ways. I'll show you both ways if you'd like. Would you like to see that? Okay, so on the left-hand side, we'll do traditional. On the right-hand side, we'll do p-val. Traditional first, and then we'll do the, the p-value method. The first thing you need to do in each case in each case, is determine whether you're talking about a left tail, a right tail, or a two tail test. So what do you think here? Are we a two tail test? No. Left tail test? No. Right tail test? Yeah. How can you tell? So yeah, you just look right here. Whatever that, so that, that, matter, that number doesn't matter. Doesn't matter at all. This number right here is already in your test statistic. It's already done for you. So the work's done. That doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is that. That's telling you left, right, or two. You got it? So are we dealing with a, what was it again? Right. Okay, so in each case, no matter what, you're going to draw a picture for me. Both of these pictures will look identical right now. The difference is the way you go about it. In the traditional method, here is what you do. Please watch very carefully on the board because I'm going to ask you for both methods on your final exam. Here's the traditional method. Traditional method says you're going to take your alpha, you're going to look that up in the chart, which I had you do just a little bit ago, right? And you're going to say, say that this is a critical value of 1.645. Remember that number? Are you okay on where that number comes from? Okay. Because this alpha is 0 0.05. Remember that this is a critical value. This right here is our rejection region. Did you get me so far on the traditional method? This is old, old stuff. We've already done that before. Now you'd go ahead and you would compare your test statistic. What's the test statistic in this case? 1.18. Great, 1.18. It says test statistic, right? It's got a z-score. Even though that, that still has a z-score, you're comparing two z's here. Compare 1.18 to your, your picture now. Is it in the rejection region or the fail to reject region? 1.18 is, it's over here. That's the fail to reject. Fail to reject. So your decision would be fail to reject H of zero. In English, we'll deal with interpretation just a bit. It would be, I, there's not enough evidence to um, to support the claim that whatever, whatever we're talking about, okay? There's not enough evidence you fail to reject. 
Right now we're just re seeing if we reject or not. Now we should absolutely have the same decision here. If we don't, then something's wrong. So let's go ahead, let's look at p-value. First, raise your hand if you're okay with traditional. Are you okay with that, what we just did? Let's, if you're not raising your hand, I assume we're not. Let's, let's see if we are or not. Yes, no? Good, okay, that's, that's everybody. Now, the, the p-value method works differently. There's no such thing as a critical value when you're dealing with the p-value method. What the p-value method does is this. It says you take your test statistic, and that's what you put right here. and you find the area that's associated with that. That's known as a p-value. Now this is all going to come back to you. Chapter 6 is going to smash you in the face right now. Do you remember how to look up areas associated with z-scores? Do you? On your calculator you put in uh, normal CDF from 1.18 to 10. Remember doing that? On your table you look up 1.18. So go ahead and do that now. Look at 1.18. You're looking at z-scores now. Look up 1.18. Say that one more time, Chris. 0.8810. Did everyone find 0 0.8810? Now, here's, here's the big thing. Where, where some of you guys have not really kind of conquered this yet, even, even up to this date. If you do 0 0.8810, look at the board. Is this 0.8810? You gotta be smarter than your table. What's your table give you? Did it give you the right or the left? Oh. It gave you this. This is 0 0.8810. Well, how do you find that one? The p value, therefore, is 0 0.1190. You okay with that? How many people feel okay with finding the p-value? Now here's what you do with it. You compare now your p-value to your alpha. What's your alpha? What's your alpha? It should be on the board. All you got to do is put the right symbol between them. This is your p-value. This is your alpha. Which one's bigger? So do I have this? Greater than, or do I have this less than? I have greater than. If your p-value is bigger than your alpha, you reject your null. Reject h sub, uh, sorry, you, uh, you fail to reject h sub 0. If your p-value is less than alpha, it says it's rare enough to reject it. So what do we do here? Do we reject, or do we fail to reject? We're in this case, right? P-value is bigger than alpha. We fail to reject. Zero. Same exact situation as before, just a different way of looking at it. So, which one has a critical value, traditional or p-value? Which one has a p-value? Well, clearly p-value. Uh, in each case, you still have a test statistic though, right? It's, it's just whether you're comparing a test statistic to the critical value, or whether you're finding the area out from your test statistic and comparing it to your alpha. Okay, we've got about 30 more seconds here. I want to show you one more and then we'll be done. Firstly, are you dealing with a one-tail, two-tail test? So you would have this shape, but now you'd have two tails. If I'm talking about the traditional method, here's how it would look. Look at the board with me, please. If I talk about traditional method, this is 0 .2, or 0 0.025, and this is 0 0.025, making this negative 1.96 and 1.96. Do you follow me on that? Would you reject or not? You should be able to make that determination right now. Would you reject or not? What's your test statistic? 
2.2. Does it fall in the rejection region? Where's 2.34? It's over here, right? This says 2.34 falls here, you would reject H0. Does that make sense to you? P-value method does something a little bit different. In this case, you have 2.34 here with a negative and 2.34. Notice how my test statistics now go in there and I find my areas. Just watch carefully. I'm going to do the math for you. You all know how to look up negative 2.34 on your, your distribution, right? That's going to give you 0 0.0096. And of course, this is symmetrical. This would also be 0 0.0096. Are you following me on that? You're looking for the area in the tables. You look up this number. 0 0.0096. You don't have to look it up twice. It's the same exact area. Here's your p-value, though. Your p-value is what you get when you add those two together. You get a little bit of area in both of them. So add them together, you're going to get, uh, let's see, 0 0.0192. And you compare that to 0 0.05. Which one's bigger, the point? 0, 0192 or the 0.05. So you have this situation. If you have this situation, the p-value is less than or equal to your alpha, you would again reject H0. So two ways of looking at it. You have critical values, compare it, or you look up the test statistic itself and you get your, your area. How many people feel okay with what we talked about? Good deal.